Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Brianna Westbrook. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Thank you for inviting me to come speak today about this very important topic. I took a step into politics shortly after Trump's um, November win years ago. <laughs> I think we all remember that night. Yes, we do. I remember it very vividly. I remember crying. I remember worrying about my neighbors, worrying about my friends, my daughter's future. The world as we know it. Didn't quite know what to do. I went into work two days later, and my boss told me this. Bree, you're just going to have to live in it. You're just going to have to accept it. And anybody that knows me <laughs> knows that I don't take things like that. <laughs> I don't take accepting living in a world that is full of hate, bigotry, bigotry sexism, discrimination. I don't live in that world. And that world is not what we deserve. Yeah. In that world. And that world is not the world that I want my child to live in and raise the children that she will have one day if she so chooses. So I took that energy and that motivation and I went home that night in 2016 and tried to find the best way I could to use my voice to influence change. At the time, I didn't think I could run for politics, like any position in politics, because I didn't look like anybody, and I sure to hell didn't come from the background like many politicians that we know. You see, I grew up in severe poverty here in Phoenix. I was born in Mesa years ago. My family struggled with addiction, substance abuse, domestic violence. I've seen far more than I should throughout my life. I've experienced lots of trauma. I vividly remember rummaging through trash cans with my grandfather to find whoppers that were thrown out at Burger King. I remember rummaging through trash cans outside of Dunkin' Donuts at the end of the shift to get whatever we possibly could to bring home and put in our fridge to feed us for that week. I remember when the constable came to our apartment complex knocked on the door and told us we had to have our belongings out. I remember throwing our belongings out the second story window of that apartment complex because the landlord was changing the locks and we had to mobilize fast as a family. That was trauma and that was violence. That trauma and violence is still happening today. After we got kicked out of that apartment, I remember driving about a half a block away to what was at the time a Smitty's parking lot on the corner of 15th Avenue in Glendale. And I remember asking my mom, why are we here? Why are we in this parking lot? Why are we not in a home? She told me we were camping. We didn't have a home, we were unhoused. This is the story of many people in Phoenix. The number of people experiencing chronic homelessness in the city of Phoenix has risen by 73% since 2016, and it has no, no way of slowing down, if you ask me. Because we have politicians in office from all layers of government that center the needs of themselves rather than the needs of the communities. I've found in my time in politics that people get into this space for one of two reasons. One, for power, and two, to help people. Oftentimes, it is power and selfishness that provides most politicians the motivation that they need to run. We do not have as many people as we should that center the needs of the community. But I feel that that time is changing, especially here in Arizona. But that's going to come through persistence, dedication, commitment. It takes time to get the change that we all seek. And we know that it's not going to happen overnight. 
but it happens through conversations, it hap happens through mobilizing our communities and talking about the issues that are important. So when I decided to run for Congress in 2018, I knew I didn't have a snowball's chance in hell in winning. I was running in a district that was overwhelmingly Republican, was not kind to people like me, an outspoken trans woman that's centered what many would call socialist ideas. <laughs> socialist ideas like providing health care for all our citizens. <laughs> socialist ideas like ensuring that people are paid a living wage and paid for the full work that they, that they, that they do. <laughs> socialist ideas like understanding that human rights our human rights. So I took that platform and what I did is I centered the ideas that I know meet the moment. A living wage, free college education, universal health care, speaking truth to power about the corruption in our political system and the fact that most of our elections are decided by the candidates who raise the most money, not the best ideas. Did you know 90% of, of the time, the candidate with the most money wins elections? That's astonishing. That's not right, but it is. It doesn't have to be, and it will not always be. As we saw this cycle, numerous candidates who ran clean, and what that is is run a publicly funded uh, a campaign by gathering a certain number of signatures in the state funding your campaign. We can break that narrative, but it takes resolve and it takes dedication. So we fell short in that primary, but I'm proud looking back because what we did is we won other ways. And this is what I tell every single candidate that I talk to about running for office. You can win elections, not just at the ballot box, you can win elections by influ influencing the conversation, raising public consciousness about ideas, inspiring leaders of tomorrow. Yes. That is one of, arguably, I feel, one of the most important reasons why we run for office, is to inspire others, because collectively, that's how we're gonna win. Yep. It was hard losing that race. It really was, because as many of our candidates have spoke about today, you, you have a lot of personal conversations with people on doors, and they share their struggles, their pain. And as a candidate, you hold that in. And I speak those stories, and those are what motivate me when I'm down. This is that person that I had a conversation with who shared that personal story of struggle. So I picked myself up, and continued to, to move on, to move forward, to keep moving. I decided to run for state senate simply to continue what we started and not to divide the base that I built and support my primary opponent in that uh, special election. It was the second special election of the post-Trump era. And it was important that we stood together in that moment. So I continue to, to resolve to, to work and knock doors and have conversations. We fell short in that primary too. So you're seeing a, a pattern here, that's twice I failed, right? But I did not. I decided to keep moving. I decided to run for a position in my state party because I felt that we need better leaders in our state party. I decided to run for a second vice chair position for the Maricopa Democratic Party. A position that I felt needed some influence and change to support local candidates, to change the strategy of how we talk to voters and the issues that we talk about. I ran against somebody that's been in party politics for a long time. I fell short by 41 votes. At this point, I'm like, am I ever gonna win? <laughs> but I 
centered myself in those stories and the reason why I'm doing the things that I've chosen to do with my time. Picked myself up, decided to run again. This time for a position in the state Democratic Party. Just as I did before with my position in the Maricopa County Democratic Party, we need change at the state level as well. Arguably, if not more. Somebody like me has never ran for that position, an executive board position for the Arizona Democratic Party. But you know what I did? I did it. <laughs> I won that election and I became the first um, trans vice chair elected in all of the United States to a position in, the, in a Democratic Party. Through my time as vice chair for the Arizona Democratic Party, I wanted to demystify the party and bring as many people in as possible because we have to continue to build, right? I championed and helped um, lead the push on many state party resolutions such as gender neutral restrooms in all Arizona Democratic Party spaces, full party support for universal health care, full party support for the Green New Deal, full party support for not supporting the border wall. Why? Because these resolutions and support from our Arizona Democratic Party helped organizers on the outside mobilize and pressure their elected officials to support ideas that meet the moment. It was important. And as we look around Phoenix, we see that it is more important than ever, than ever, that we have people in office that represent the needs of the people. As, as stated, the unhoused population continues to grow. When I was running for state representative this last time, I can't tell you how many stories that I heard from tenants sharing the fact that their landlord raised their rent upwards of 20% or more in a very short amount of time. Many of these people told me that they don't know how they're going to afford to pay rent. There is a woman that I spoke to in Sunny Slope who lived in a duplex for nearly 10 years. She became deaf during 2020, not related to COVID. So we had a conversation on a notepad, a very emotional conversation. She invited me into our home. We chatted for about 30 minutes and she shared with me what was happening in her life. For the longest time in this duplex, she paid $400 a month. It was enough for her to get by, have a little bit of money on the side, and food on the table. The second landlord that managed her property, because it changed hands, an investor came in and bought it, came to her apartment to fix a pipe that she reported was leaking. A leaking pipe that still is not fixed to today. She told me this landlord raised her rent $400, 30 days in advance. And it gets worse. She told me the landlord is going to raise her rent in $100 intervals for the next 90 days, each month. You know what's going to happen to this woman? She's more than likely going to end up on the streets because she's living on Social Security and she barely has enough to get by. For what? For this investor could put more capital and more money in their pocket at her expense. It doesn't have to be this way. We need laws in place that help our people. Laws like rent control so landlords can't do what they did to this woman. We need laws in place to stop investors from buying houses in our communities, six, seven houses, remodeling one house on the, on the block to raise the comps of all the other houses, pricing many of us out of the market. 
We need people that are willing to champion laws that say no more to this predatory behavior. And there's no more important place than this in the center of Phoenix. You drive around, you see people sleeping at bus stops in 105 degree weather, 115 degree weather. We see stories in the news of unhoused community members dying on city streets. And we know that those numbers are severely undercounted. The numbers are not stopping. People are dying on streets simply because of heat exhaustion and other natural causes. They're pushed into encampments. They're arrested and put in jail because we've decided to incarcerate people rather than build homes. We've decided to incarcerate people rather than wrapping people in the services that they need to move on from the experiences of homelessness. We've decided to put capitalism above the needs of the people. And it's not right, and we do not have to accept it, and we will not accept it. So we ran in a very competitive primary. I was the one district that was um, redistricted to actually have three incumbents, not two for the race that I was running. We ran a very great campaign. I did not take a dollar from corporate interests. I ran a campaign rooted in morals, centered in community, and included everybody in the conversation as possible. We showed what you can do and how you should run a campaign. We said no to corporate money from the healthcare industry. We said no to money from police unions. We said no to money from investors. We said no to money from big banks like Bank of America, Citigroup. We said no. Our campaign was powered by small dollar donations from everybody from across the sun. We showed it was possible. We ran a strong campaign and achieved north of 7,200 votes. This loss hurt more than the other three. I still get choked up thinking about it. But I remind myself daily, just like I am today to you, that we have to continue to move forward through difficulty and failure. Another thing that I tell people, and I tell people this with anything in life, fail big. <laughs> fail often. And keep failing. Why? Because through failure comes success. Through failure comes strength. Through failure, we learn from our mistakes. Through failure, we grow resolve. Failure is one of the most important things that we can experience. Because if we don't fail, we're not trying. So fail. I'm going to keep failing. I'm going to keep going. That's why I'm going to start earlier than ever next year. I'm going to be begin knocking on doors in February, and we're going to do it again. I'm going to run as a clean elections candidate. What that means? Publicly funded in a district that was the most expensive primary in all of Arizona. Half a million dollars was raised between the candidates in my primary. Half a million dollars for a $26,000 a year job. Think about that. That is absurd. 
And the people that came out on the other end, we know did not meet the moment. They simply had more money. So me, I'm not from wealth. I grew up dirt poor. I'm not privileged enough to take time off from work. I still have to work 40 hours a week while running, like many of us do. The system's not designed for people like us to run and win. It's meant to chew us up and throw us out. But we know through perseverance and persistence in our struggle that we have to continue to go, continue to get up every day, continue to work. So I'm going to end on thank you for having this conversation today. Thank you for allowing us this time to speak, share our stories. Hopefully you take from this one story, one sentence, one memory that you can share with your neighbors and community members. That we continue to fight on these dark times. The news that recently dropped, you know, about healthcare here in Arizona hurts because we know what's going to happen, right? Those that are most marginalized, the poor, they are the ones that are going to be criminalized, or the people with the most money will be able to still get the care that they need. We know that people are still dying on our city streets. But we need to continue to do the work, whatever it may be, whether it's organizing in our communities, whether it's running for office, volunteering our time for campaigns and causes that we're passionate about, because all of these things matter, and that's the only way we're going to build the world that we all know that we deserve. So dedication, commitment, and resolve, and radical empathy for each other, and, and compassion. So whatever your, whatever your gift is, use it. Use your gift. Continue to go, continue to, to work. It may seem like it's a long ways away to that place and that world that we think that we all know that we deserve. It's not gonna happen overnight, but if we continue to, to, to work, we will achieve it. There's no better example of this than the two women, the three women that, that spoke before me. Keep moving. Keep going. Thank you.